27-year-old Chelsea Spade is earning her master's degree in social work, but to make ends meet, she's working as a part-time cab driver in Washington, D.C., through a company called Lyft. But Chelsea isn't like most D.C. taxi drivers. Traditional cabbies have no way to buy their own cars, because each D.C. taxi is required to have a special permit, which the city has stopped issuing. So the only way to get a vehicle is to rent one from a handful of companies in the district that already own large fleets of permitted cabs. Chelsea, on the other hand, simply drives her own car. Since she doesn't have a top light or a uniform paint job, she affixes a giant pink mustache to her front grate to make her car easy to identify for customers. I was laughing so hard. Is that a mustache? <laughs> Traditional cabbies in D.C. don't just need a permit for their cars. They need permits for themselves as well. For years, the city had stopped minting new drivers altogether, though recently it started again. Still, aspiring cabbies need to take a mandatory class and pass a test before they can apply. Chelsea, on the other hand, saw an advertisement for Lyft online. After a few hours of training, she was on the road. If you have a car and you have some time on your hands, which I do, why not meet people in the city and, and get paid for it? Customers of traditional taxis generally hail them on the street. Chelsea's customers find her by opening Lyft's mobile app, which allows them to see her car on a tiny map and hire her for a ride. How's it going? Good. Lyft, along with its competitors Uber and Sidecar, are remaking the taxi business in cities all over the world, while kicking to the curb the bevy of useless government rules and licensing requirements that exist in almost all major cities. But local politicians and government bureaucrats are fighting back against this new model. Washington, D.C. recently proposed new rules that would force Chelsea to obtain a special license to operate, require that she have her car inspected by the city every six months, and allow her to work no more than 20 hours per week. In Philadelphia, New York City, Austin, and Minneapolis, Chelsea's car could be impounded if she were caught driving. In San Antonio, she might get arrested. There's no logical case against allowing Lyft, Sidecar, and Uber to operate freely. The fight is all about protecting the existing taxi cartel. In fact, passengers are safer riding with Chelsea than in a regular cab because traditional taxis don't provide their customers with an easy way for registering complaints. With Lyft, passengers get to rate their experience after every ride. And if drivers get consistently lousy reviews, the company will fire them. Knowing that there's going to be feedback from the customer will cause suppliers to raise their quality. And so just sort of the fact that in some sense you're being monitored by the crowd. This is a very powerful form of sort of quality assurance. Arun Sandarajan is a professor at NYU who studies businesses like Lyft, Uber, and Sidecar, which are part of what's been dubbed the sharing economy. He says that the customer feedback mechanisms built into these new online platforms makes them largely self-governing. Rather than needing a government regulator to ensure cleanliness of a particular sort of like shared accommodation space, you can rely on the reputation system to enforce that. So a lot of the screening or prevention is going to be done by the marketplace itself. Another big advantage of these businesses is that they don't require any upfront investment. Models that tap into underutilized assets that already exist, these peer-to-peer -peer models, will grow a lot more rapidly and have much better economic fundamentals than business models that require you to buy assets and deploy them. Airbnb has scaled the idea of staying in someone else's apartment for a short period of time. There's peer-to-peer -peer car rental services. There's carpooling.com in Europe, which is a city-to-city ride-sharing service. And they've got this massive transportation network from different European cities to other European cities. And this has been done without the creation of any new infrastructure. These businesses are part of yet an even larger trend in which new technologies, including online marketplaces, 3D printers, and virtual cryptocurrencies, are cutting out middlemen and allowing individuals to trade goods and services of all sorts directly with each other. These new business models will remake our economy, that is, unless the government stands in the way.